Uh, yeah, my name is Jamie, actually, and uh, I teach Buddhist studies here uh, at Smith College uh, in the program in Buddhist studies and also in the religion department. And uh, I want to thank, of course, first our sponsors, Ada Hau Kent, uh, wherever she might be, a long time ago, endowed uh, a fund that we get to use for uh, Asian religion programming and things like this. And so thank you, Ada Hau Kent, wherever you might be. Uh, the religion department and uh, the lecture fund at Smith College all who have come together to help uh, fund all of this. And so we're very, uh, very happy and honored to have uh, Professor Mark Blum uh, back among us um, to give us a talk today. Um, but before that, I want to take a few minutes to just sort of uh, remind us uh, why we're here, because uh, we're gathered together for this talk on the Tanli Show, uh, a major text by Shinran, a major, hugely important um, Buddhist figure from Japan, uh, because this is the third annual Taifetsu Unno Memorial Lecture. Um, probably few in the valley would know anything about <coughs> Shin Buddhism or Pure Land Buddhism, the topic of Mark's talk tonight, uh, if it weren't for Taifetsu Unno. Uh, who was a priest in the Pure Land, the Jo Jodo Shinshu tradition, it's called, or we, we say in English, Pure Land. Um, and uh, Tai Tetsu Uno introduced that to the valley. It's not a very well-known tradition in the West, but probably uh, in East Asia, certainly in Japan, I'd say it's the dominant form of Buddhism. And in as much as uh, Japanese Americans and their religion is or their Buddhism is probably numerically the largest form of Buddhism in America. Uh, probably, actually, um, Shin Buddhism or Pure Land Buddhism is the largest form of Buddhism uh, in America today. I mean, right? That's Maybe. probably close to say, even yeah. though many folks outside of the Japanese American uh, world won't know anything about it. So, uh, Tai Tetsu Unno, or uh, Unno Sensei as we know him, or simply Tai, um, there's another Tai in the world, but this is our Tai. Uh, not Thich Nhat Hanh Thai, this is the Thai Uno Thai. Um, and of course his beloved wife Alice were uh, extremely important here in the valley for Buddhism and Buddhist studies and their easy movement between and support of uh, town-gown relations uh, and events are, uh, are legendary. And he uh, was a pioneer of Buddhist studies here at Smith College and in the valley more generally he passed away in December of 2014. Um, and I'm not going to say anything about all of his bio and his publications and all his major works, although I will hand some around just so you can get a little flavor of it, including a, copies of the work that uh, Mark is going to talk about. Um, you can just take a look at these, River of Fire, River of Water. Um, these are uh, great books. And um, do be sure that they come back to me. There are special karmic rewards for stealing Buddhist books. I know I'm probably going to get a few of those myself. So, um, um, and Tai is interesting. Although he was born into a long line of Pure Land priests, Jodo Shinshu priests um, in Japan, he was actually the 13th generation of uh, ordained priests in his family. He was interested in much, much more than, um, than simply that kind of a heritage. Um, in particular, he was interested in aesthetics, the philosophy of religion, psychology of religion. We have a, um, a Jungian analyst here who uh, begged uh, uh, a professorship in anthropology to follow Jungian uh, trends, in good part because of Tai Uno's um, inspirations. Um, and in particular, uh, Zen Buddhism. Some of you might remember last year, uh, Mark, uh, uh, James Dobbins gave a talk on uh, D.T. Suzuki, uh, mostly known for his Zen work, but also very important in the Shin tradition. Um, and over the course of his long years here, he taught here at Smith from 1971 to 1998, um, retiring as the Jill Kerr Conway Professor, uh, a position that I now hold, um, though I'm just <laughs> a shadow of what uh, Tai was here. Um, he taught all kinds of things uh, related to Buddhism. In fact, probably he was one of the pioneers of Buddhism and certainly Buddhist studies uh, here in the valley. Um, but he was a little bit of a rebel too, so that actually as the eldest son, he should have taken over the family temple, but he left. Uh, and left it to his younger son in order to pursue an academic career. Um, but still, he was a practicing Buddhist um, at heart, and so he started here at Smith College, uh, the first regular Buddhist sitting uh, group among the colleges. And um, although many people have taken turns, even I led it for a little while um, uh, over the years, um, it's always been uh, run by a Zen priest, and that tradition is continuing today uh, with uh, our very own um, uh, Ruth Ozeki, 
uh, who is here among us, a Smith graduate and renowned author, uh, as well as a Zen uh, Buddhist priest, who, and she's now running the Zen Buddhist City Group here at Smith College. Um, at the same time, however, Snai also started a study group uh, at his house that studied the Pure Land Buddhist tradition uh, with a group of people. Um, and uh, it's kind of fun. Uh, we used to call the Zen Buddhist group, that the meditation group that he met here, we called uh, Bud, uh, Bud Med, and the study group that uh, met at his house was called Bud Stud. Um, and it was the study group that he started at his house that actually evolved into the Shin Sangha of Northampton, a group that is still um, somewhat uh, among us. And, um, and it's this kind of thing that I want to say finally about Thai, uh, before I turn to uh, talking about Mark a little bit. Um, he had really a boundless, he and Alice, uh, his wife, who worked in the schools as a special ed teacher, had uh, a boundless capacity for reaching out to people, making their home available to everything from Thanksgiving to Super Bowl matches, um, uh, all kinds of things over the years, tea ceremony, and on and on and on. And as I say, these town gown boundaries were entirely blurred with Thai. And as a newbie to the valley in 1985, when I arrived, he took my wife uh, and myself under his wing, and um, through his friendships, drinking buddies, reading groups, dinner parties, uh, and even tennis. Uh, he laid me flat on my back when I was uh, playing tennis on the tennis courts. Um, I came to know and appreciate circles far, far and wide beyond um, Smith College. So um, in as much as this talk today was inspired by his, his presence and his, uh, his great work among us all, uh, his magic, his karmic connections, continue and you are all now uh, embraced in those karmic connections uh, as well. So um, with that, now we talk to, um, turn to our main event, uh, Professor Mark Blum. As I said, we're very happy. Uh, Mark Blum uh, is coming to us from uh, Berkeley, from UCAL Berkeley, where he's uh, the Ito Shinjo Distinguished Chair in Japanese Studies. Um, among the many things we share, it's, it's hard to describe how many things Mark and I uh, share over the years. But um, before he left for Berkeley, uh, he was here from, gee, from about 19, mid-90s? No, late 90s. Late 90s till yes. about 2013, so right. about 15 years or so. Yeah. Uh, he was here teaching um, at SUNY Albany and a regular participant in many of our events uh, here at Buddhist In fact, I just found out that among other shared things we have, uh, we both came uh, to, uh, to teach in the Valley because our wives got jobs here, <laughs> and we followed our wives along. Uh, he, he left. Um, he didn't leave his wife, but he left the valley. Uh, to Berkeley. Um, I stayed behind. Um, Mark is uh, a renowned scholar of the Pure Land tradition. He's written six or seven books on, on the tradition, uh, as well as a very prolific scholar. He's currently uh, just finished volume one, or the publication has just come out of volume one of the Mahapati Nirvana Sutra, an, an immense and, ex and, and immensely important uh, Buddhist scripture that he's translating from the Chinese. Um, six or seven other books, um, countless publications, uh, and far beyond that. And as I said, Mark and I, um, people make fun of me, but I, I see him these days. We're always around the world together. I attended, he led a workshop in Dunhuang in the famous Buddhist caves way out in West China about a year and a half ago that I attended. Uh, and then just a few months ago, we were hanging out together where he was a keynote speaker at an event uh, relating to DT Suzuki in Kyoto, Japan. Um, and so before uh, I turn the podium off, I always have to tell this one story uh, that goes way back um, maybe 40 years ago to when I first met him. And we were all hanging out in Kyoto, um, studying and doing things, uh, studying and doing things. Uh, and one day, so I knew him um, as, I think we were both grad students at the time still. Uh, and I saw him walking down the street with a guitar in his hand. Um, and as a musician wannabe, I'm always impressed with somebody who actually is a musician. Um, and so I stopped him and, and, and talked to him, and he said to me, Ah, Jamie, you know, Buddhist studies is cool, but I'd really rather be a rock and roll star. <laughs> so, uh, so with that, uh, Dr. Mark Flom, thank you very much. He always does that, you know, and then I, I have no response to that, you know. Thanks, Jamie. That's what we um, and I'm going to pass this around if you're not already on our mailing list for these things, in addition to the website and this five college Buddhist studies. Uh, a website and Facebook pages and things we send out mailings and whatnot. So if you're not on it, um, please sign up. Thank you very much um, for that nice introduction. I'm very honored to be here, and I'm also within the karmic loop of uh, Professor Unno. In fact, I attended. I didn't know it was, know it was called Bud Stud. 
I attended that meeting in his house once. Um, I'm one of the very few non-Asian uh, heritage scholars who studies Pure Land Buddhism. Uh, James Dobbins is another one. There's really only about, at this point, two of us really active in the field. And uh, James has gone in a certain direction. I've gone a very different direction. And partly it's because we came out of different programs in grad school. But, um, but just before I start, let me just say that I, um, I'm not here as a um, proponent of anything. And I'm not ordained in any group. But I have very deep relationships with four different Buddhist groups in Japan. And a lot of what I do is because of a lot of what they do, OK? And so in some sense, I see my role, or I'm, what I'm, I suppose the, the main motivation for all of my research and writing and, and speaking is to understand how these traditions work within themselves and to communicate that to a larger audience. So um, one of the great things about uh, like Professor Uno and um, others of that generation is that they brought Buddhism to America as part of their own family heritage. Um, and um, Buddhism has really taken off in the United States in many interesting ways as a result. Um, as a scholar, though, as a historian of this, what, what I feel very keenly is that although many of the Buddhist um, influences, ideas, texts, um, doctrines, pr practices that have come into the West, that have had such a big impact, as great as they are, there's a lot more, a lot more. There's a lot more that has not been communicated. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. Okay? So this is one of the gold mines of Buddhism in Asia that is only here, the name is here, the, the translation of the surface is here, but it's the tip of the iceberg. And so I have been uh, interested in this text. In fact, um, the Tani Show is perhaps the first text on Pure Land Buddhism I ever read. And I may have even have bid Professor Uno's translation. I don't know at the time because I was too young. But, um, and I, I have spoken with him about it. But one thing about uh, Tai Uno also was she was very interested in the Kyoto School of Philosophy. And the Kyoto School of Philosophy, people who are in philosophy studies or interested in Buddhism all know about this. And if you, uh, but what we find again in the West is the people who are interested in Buddhism and interested in the Kyoto School of Philosophy the intersection that they usually see between those two is Zen. But in fact, there's just as much Pure Land in the Kyoto School of Philosophy as there is Zen. But because people in the West don't know much about Pure Land thought and how Pure Land doctrine works and what the tensions are within it and what the appeal about it is, they don't see that side of the Kyoto School. In fact, there's a, the woman who is now in the chair of the Shukyo Tetsugaku, what is that in English? Philosophy of Religion uh, at Kyoto University, which is where the Kyoto School began under Nishida. Uh, her name is Keta Masako, and she has this huge book on uh, Pure Land th Dynamics, Pure Land Thought, okay? In fact, that's her major publication at this point. Uh, in fact, uh, well, this talk is also connected to Nishida, who started the Kyoto School. Like, I'm not a Kyoto School person, but again, it's just one of the many ways you can come into this stuff. The, um, <coughs> oh, sorry about that. Uh, Nishida, who starts this school, he's one, essentially a student of Kiyozawa Manshi. Kiyozawa Manshi is sort of the progressive Pure Land thinker uh, in the modern period, who starts a whole movement. Okay. Anyway, so one more thing before we start. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the kind of sectarian dynamics and how this hermeneutic tradition evolved. And for those of you not familiar with Japanese institutional structures, okay, the largest Buddhist institution in Japan is called Honganji. And it, um, it's founded by Shinran. Uh, and until from for the first 350 years or so, there was one Honganji. It was so big, though, uh, in the 16th century, when Japan went through a period of civil war, um, this group had to protect itself. And so they built their temples as castles, like everybody else. And they had armies to protect themselves. Uh, and other warlords began to ask to borrow their armies, OK? And so they got involved in the political conflict. And so when the country was finally unified again around 1600, the shogun that really set up um, a government structure that gave Japan peace for 250 years um, used a sibling rivalry among the two, two of the sons who were in succession uh, to take over the Honganji and managed to split it into two groups. When you split it into two groups, uh, at that time, it was only because these two brothers were competing with each other, had no ideological component whatsoever. However, when you get to the end of that period, when you get to 1868, so Japan is isolated from 16, 
1830 to 1867. 1868, Japan opens up to the world again. At that point, for reasons that nobody can understand, these two schools have gone in opposite directions in the way they understand their own shared tradition. Professor Unno was a brilliant exponent of the Nishi side, the Western side. But the Kyoto School of Philosophy and my own training is on the other side, okay? So I'm gonna to bring to you the other side. Probably most of you don't know anything about this. Maybe you do, I'll be elated. Um, I brought four books in Japanese on the tiny show. They're all written, or three of them are written by Eastern side people. And it's the Eastern tradition that for reasons that are, again, I don't know, really dominate this whole intellectual movement and Kiyozawa himself this teacher of Nishida is also from the east side. So this is called the Otani branch. So anyway, and there's a university in Kyoto called Otani that Jamie and I both studied at as grad students. Okay, what is this? Anyone know what this is? I heard you can put images into Google now and it can identify them. So this is a, a, a ritual called Nerikuyo from a temple in Nara, Japan. Um, and it is an, an enactment of a myth, the mythical understanding of what happens if you die, okay, uh, being involved in a kind of samadhi of meditation on a particular Buddha, the Amitabha Buddha, okay? Um, and the myth is that if you can be in samadhi at the moment of at death, so this is a big thing in medieval Japan, is to prepare for death in a way so that death does, I, I even published an article on this, death in, in ancient Japan never happened in isolation. If it did, it was a failure. Death always was a collective event, and lots of people would be there at the death. And people would help you prepare for the death because as you're going in and out of consciousness, because most people are in some kind of pain, right? Well, that's why they're dying. <laughs> um, it's hard to maintain that meditative concentration. And so what developed in the 10th, 11th century is a series of recitations. And the dying person would recite Nembutsu, okay? Uh, and the people around him would recite it, and they would recite it together. And as the dying person goes in and out of consciousness, his mind is sustained, it's held up by all the people around him. Um, such, and, and why? Because if he can stay in that state of mind when he dies, this is what he sees, okay? These bodhisattvas coming down from the Pure Land, right? Carrying uh, various uh, objects to greet him with, okay? So in this temple in Nara, they staged this outside. These masks, many of them are 14th century, they're quite old. And they walk on this platform as if they're going off to the Pure Land. It's really spectacular to see. So that's what this is. This is not a Shin temple, but, it's, but this is part of the same heritage. This goes way, way back uh, to the 8th century in Japan. Okay. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. I always like it. Like, okay, so it started in the 8th century, and how did somebody die? That's a really hard question. <laughs> you know, it's hard to know. I mean, for this, for example, there are actually a, ver a, a number of different ritual enactments of this death scene, okay? There's a tremendous visual art for example, paintings. So from the 12th century, so we begin to have really spectacular paintings. Some of the most beautiful paintings in Japanese history are paintings of this scene. Um, but this thing of wearing masks and walking on a plank like this, today, this is the only place this is done. Nobody has any idea why it's done here, how it got to be done here. We know various material things that are associated with this. For example, um, there is a embroidered mandala, okay, from the, well, nobody quite knows when, but supposedly from the eighth century, okay, of the Pure Land scene. It's all like 30 women worked on this, okay, and it's huge. I mean, it's as big as this screen, okay. Um, and it took them years and years and years to complete in great detail. In fact, uh, it's still, we still have it. It's in tatters because it's so old. And these old, you know, particularly because it's, it's embroidered, it's, the more it was hung up and the sun hit it, the more it kind of deteriorated and it's that old. But nonetheless, we know that this is a great scene um, that inspired people. And so death is always very much tightly involved with temple activity, okay? So the idea, if it possible, is to bring the temple to your house, okay? So that when you die, but we have lots of medieval art, also, pictures also of people dying at temples. Um, and um, we even have pictures of people dying at temples in which the, you know, Japanese houses, the walls can be taken out, right? 
So you have complete exposure to the outside. Well, people just walk up casually and say, oh, looks like someone's dying there, you know, and the, there's a dog and he's patting the dog. I mean, they put this, they include this stuff in the picture. So in fact, it was very common, very much accepted. How this got put together, who, who thought of this? I don't know, this is obviously some creative genius who, it's, and when you see this, it's just awe-inspiring. In fact, some of the masks, they can't see out of the, they can't see through, the eye holes are too small or they're so narrow that they have to have somebody actually stand with them and guide them so they don't fall over, yeah. Yeah, we could, I could do a lecture about that if I, but I'm doing something else here. Okay, so let's, oops, in the wrong place, okay. Okay, critically reading the Tanya show. So, um, what is it, so I have a, for those of you not familiar with the text, I did a little printout, maybe we should like read a couple things so you know why this is, people respond to this the way they do. Uh, so, how about I ask for a volunteer, for just read the first couple things. Any volunteers? No volunteers? There you are. Chapter two, yeah. So this, so this is a situation in which um, Shinran has asked questions and he's responding, okay? Um, as we'll see later, some people find therefore this text not to be legitimate because it's not written by Shinran. What we're getting is the believer's perspective, okay? Who's in the room and observing this kind of question and answer s session, okay? These are his notes, all right, go ahead. That's the, that's the pure land of Amitabha, yeah. But then you start to ply me with questions as to whether I know of some other way to birth than Nembutsu or whether I know some other passages in the literature. So what is Nembutsu? Nembutsu is this recitation phrase, Namo Amida Butsu, that is uh, at once a mantra, uh, a basis for samadhi, and in the case of Shinran, an object of faith. So if you know Buddhist doctrine, um, the Nembutsu for Shinran is a Nirmanakaya. It's a, it's, a, it's a manifest, a physical manifestation of the Buddha's presence in the world, okay? The saying itself. So for Shinran, it's not only that you say the Nembutsu, but you, 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 what can I say? You take refuge in the Nembutsu, okay? That's what he means. So it's very abstract, wild idea, okay? And there is no other practice in Buddhism that I know that has this kind of authority. And so a lot of people are constantly asking about it, right? But this is Shinran's belief system, so that's what he's talking about. Okay, go ahead. So what is going on here? <laughs> you think I'm keeping something from you, something I should come out and make a clean dress of. Well, that is a big mistake. Listen, there are any number of eminent priests installed in powerful positions in the southern capital and on the northern mountain. Why not go and pay them a visit while you're here? You could ask them all the questions you would like about the essential referral. So well, Shin, this is Shinran's response to the question of tell us how to get reborn in the Pure Land. And rebirth in the Pure Land is something that happens on, in two dimensions. On the one hand, it's a post-mortem ideal rebirth. Though you, so and part of the death ritual is that you turn over all your merit that you've accumulated to this point to that goal, okay? But on the other hand, the pure land is also accessible mentally, okay? Because it doesn't exist in a physical place. So it's also, because the, that world is also this world. So uh, it's, it's available internally and it's available externally as well, all right? So this is also part of the confusion. Uh, the, the, the key to the first, understand the first paragraph is that obviously people have come a great distance, some sort of public talk like this. Uh, people come a great distance to hear Shinran, not like me, and. And Shinran is saying, I don't have anything to teach you. In other words, I, I've already, it's pretty simple. Just say it in Nembutsu. I got nothing else to say. Okay, so part of the Tani Show's appeal is that Shinran continually is so self-deprecating. He continually reminds people he has no message for them. He's not a teacher. He's a nobody. He keeps saying, I'm a nobody. I'm a nobody. Why do you keep coming to me? Okay, uh, and this is part of his appeal. Okay, oh, go ahead, read a little more.
slowly. Just say the name Butsu and Amitabha. I will say you. Other than this, there is nothing else involved. Is saying the name Butsu indeed the seed for my birth in the Pure Land, or will it be the karmic cause for my falling into hell? How it will all turn out in the end, I don't know. Let's say I was tricked by Honen Shonen and so fell into hell for saying the name Butsu. Even so, I would have no regrets. The reason I say this is if I was <coughs> someone who could become a Buddha by my own efforts, but fell into hell instead for saying the name Butsu, then I might feel duped and filled with remorse. Instead, I am someone who cannot do any practice other than the name Butsu, so either way, I am bound straight for hell. Good. All right, we'll get into his relationship with Hona and his teacher in a second. Just the last bit. What, Amitabha or what Amitabha's original vow says is true. So the original vow, excuse me, is the name given to the, so all bodhisattvas make vows before they become Buddhas. This particular Amitabha, before he became a Buddha, he made a number of vows, and one of them is to create a, a, a Buddha realm where he will stay and remain that he will open up access and give access to anyone to. That's so, those are called pure lands. All Buddha, Kshetra, all Buddha lands are, are pure lands because they're purified by the presence of a Buddha. What's different about Amitabha's land is that he specifically makes it easy for people to get there, okay? Uh, and he tried to, tries to provide some vehicles that anyone can practice to make that possible. At least that's how the scriptures are interpreted, okay, in East Asia. Go ahead. He's the most influential Chinese thinker on this, yeah. The comments Shandao makes are true, so Honen's instructions cannot be false. What Honen told me was true, so the understanding I wish to convey to you cannot be without meaning. This is the humble understanding of the heart of things. From here on, out the name Butsu is yours to accept and believe in, or to leave behind. I leave that up to Great, okay, thanks. All right, so that's really Shinran in essence, okay, and that's the heart of this text. And since we're running out of time, we'll just stop there, and you guys, if we have a little time, we can look at some more, but let's go through this a little bit, because I got a lot of stuff on here. Um, all right, so why study the Tiny Show? Um, it's by far the best read book in Japan today. So Jamie's comment that this is the largest form of Buddhism in Japan, it's not only that, but um, of all the books, you know, if you look at Japanese society today, and you look at what books people read on Buddhism, and I have made up my own sort of informal study because I travel a lot in Japan. I'm in Japan every year. I often go to obscure, tiny bookstores. I go out of my way to do this because I want to see what books they sell on Buddhism. And I have never been to any bookstore in Japan that did not have at least one book on the Tanya Show. There is no other book like this. It's just a completely different phenomenon than anything else in Japanese religious consciousness. There is no religious book that comes close to the Tiny Show in terms of appeal. And, uh, you know, so that's the, that's the major question is why is this a case? There's a, 14th, a 13th century book. It's really, <laughs> you know, quite different uh, from our experience. It's not modern. It's not modernized in any way. It's exactly as it was. And it's hearsay. Okay, so that's part of it. So despite 150 years of westernization, et cetera, et cetera, and everything J Japan does, despite hundreds of millions of dollars, maybe billions, spent by Christian missionaries to convert the Japanese because now they have Western education, they should naturally think like Westerners, it hasn't happened, okay? In fact, the Japanese instead prefer the Tani show, okay? So that's a major question is what is that all about, right? Um, and like I say, and it's been translated 18 times into English. Um, Taino's translation remains the standard as far as I know. So we have a little Buddhist college in Berkeley called the Institute for Buddhist Studies. It is a, 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 a school created by the Nishi Honganji Buddhist Churches of America, which is Thai's denomination, and um, they train ministers there. And um, 
recently they gave a course on the English translations of the Tani Show. And so they collected all the translations and I gave a lecture or two and we looked, I helped them and we looked at it and they're all very, very similar, very similar. So there isn't a lot of variation. So one would think therefore, this is pretty straightforward text, pretty easy to understand. One would think, right? Okay. Um, okay, let's talk a little bit about Shinran, a quick bio, if you don't know who he is. He's born into an aristocratic family, but something happens. He's, he's put into a temple at the age of nine and ordained. His father ordained soon after that, so Shinran's family seemed to have fallen apart. But, you know, this is in 1182 when Japan is in the middle of a civil war. So there was a lot of disruption, a very dangerous and difficult time, okay? Um, by accident, he ends up, I mean, his, he, we know he's from an upper class family because he's put into a temple that is essentially exclusive to aristocrats. The abbot of that temple is Jian, who becomes the head of Tendai later. Tendai is the largest sect of Buddhism in Japan at the time. Um, Tendai, by, Jian, by the way, doesn't like Honen, doesn't like Shinran, uh, doesn't like this form of Buddhism. <laughs> but anyway, that's part of what was happening at the time. Shinran spends 20 years of diligent monastic uh, training uh, from the age of nine, and something happens. He has some kind of major personal crisis about this and he gets depressed. We don't really know exactly what happened or exactly what his problem was, but he alludes to it in various places, including the Tiny Show, about how he was really in a sense of crisis. And um, at that point, he hears about this charismatic teacher named Honan, and he goes to see him. And whatever happens, whatever Honan tells him, Shimon has an awakening at that moment, and his life is completely turned around. <laughs> And he sees Honen as, again, a kind of incarnation, okay, of a mythical uh, bodhisattva. In this case, Mahastama Prapta, the, one of the assistants to Amitabha Buddha. For Shinran, Honen must have some roots like that because his, his message is so powerful. He's able to transform so many people. Okay, so later Shinran would call Honen his uh, sense of failure of being a monk. And one of the things that we do know is his confession of sexual problems. So you can imagine he spent his whole male <laughs> post-puberty life in the monastery. Um, he obviously thinks he is heterosexual. He thinks about women. And apparently this has become a big issue for him. And Honen tells him the Buddha understands that it's difficult in this latter age for people to succeed in traditional monastic practice. In an anticipation of this, he creates an avenue of direct access to him in his pure land, regardless of what transgressions or sins one may commit. In essence, this is what Honan says to Shinran, the Buddha could care less about your sexuality. That no matter how much it troubles you, it doesn't trouble the Buddha, okay? From the Buddhist perspective, that's small change, okay? What matters is that you sincerely believe and explore the symbols of the Buddha's presence, okay? The presence of the Dharma, uh, and you should gain strength from that, okay. So, Shinran Amida becomes a disciple of Honen, okay. Honen um, thereafter leaves the mountain. This is up on Mount Hiei in the eastern, northeastern part of Kyoto, comes down into the city, um, where thousands come to hear him speak. And so Honen becomes almost too popular. And one of his students is, in fact, what's called the Kampaku, he's like the prime minister of Japan. So, you know, in those days, of course, the king, the emperor rules, but the emperor doesn't really rule. The emperor has a chief minister who really does, runs the government. And that's who this guy Kanezani is. And Kanezani also falls in love with Honen. And um, so, somehow during this time, Shinran leaves his monastic status and takes a wife, okay? And one of the biographies of Honen, I'm sorry, one of the biographies of Shinran says this. Um, Kanazani challenges Honen's doctrine that laymen have the same access to the Buddhist pure land as monastics. Because his presumption at that time is if you're serious about Buddhism, you join the Sangha. Okay? In fact, we know in Theravada Buddhism, you can't become an arhat if you're still a lay person, a householder in society. You have to join the Sangha. And Honen says that's not the case in, the, uh, uh, in, in this system, okay? That is uh, directed to Amitabha's pure land. So Kanezani challenged him, well, is that true? Then why don't you take one of your monks and have him become a layperson, you, if you really believe that? And Honan says, okay, I choose Shinran for that. And Shinran says, fine with me. <laughs> so according to this biography, Kanezani then said, okay, returns a favor and offers one of his daughters to Shinran in marriage, okay? 
And since Shinran is highborn anyway, and Kanazani couldn't be prime minister unless he was highborn, okay? So we have, in this biography, Shinran's wife is in fact Kanazani's daughter, okay? And he has an arranged marriage, arranged by his teacher Honan, they like that, okay? We don't know if that's true. Yeah, all right, anyway. Um, in 1207s, Honan's popularity is so great, and Kanazani falls from power, okay? In, uh, in a change of government, so Honan is exiled. Two of Honen's um, other disciples are arrested on false charges of seducing the consorts of the emperor and are executed, okay? So what's happening is the monastic institution is very much afraid of Honen because Honen is offering access to the power of Buddhism without going through the monastic system, okay? It's a direct line, okay? Um, and so Honen is exiled, Honen, and Shinran is exiled along with him. The exile is lifted in two years, but and Honen comes back and dies a couple years later, but Shinran stays away for 20 years or so, okay? Now, Shinran was certainly not the first Japanese monk to have a wife. He's just the first one to do so publicly, okay? So part of what the nature of Japanese Buddhism is, is it's a religion in which monasticism is essentially a failure. That's the Blum perspective, anyway. Uh, maybe I'll write on this someday. There's a series of, there's so much evidence that monasticism in Japan did not succeed from the get-go. There's a constant uh, uh, statements and declarations and promises to revigorate the monasticism, the precepts, et cetera, et cetera, and the Japanese say, yeah, 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 and they keep failing and failing and failing. Um, and in a way, so what makes Shinran different is not that he had a wife, because also if you read the biographies of these famous Japanese Monks in history, they all come from families of other monks, okay? So there's so much of this going on. What's different about Shinran is that he's public about it, okay, and doesn't try to hide it. And so, but Shinran himself regarded himself, um, you know, this, of course we know in ja Japanese Buddhism today no longer has monasticism, except for periods, small periods of training, they th they just given up on it. They gave up on it in the 1880s or so, but this was a trend that was already starting, obviously, much earlier. So what makes Shinran kind of unique is that he had the nerve to, to do this publicly back in the early 13th century. And this caused a lot of criticism of him, but he succeeded. But where did he succeed? Not in the capital, okay, where the old culture is dominant, but out in the countryside. Okay. So Shinran called himself neither monk nor layman, okay? He continued to sort of operate as a religious clergy, but he had a family. However, if you look at Shinran's life, he spent a lot, a great deal of time not living with his family. So I don't know how that actually worked. Anyway, that's a whole other issue, but um, let's talk about the Tanya Show itself, okay? After his return to Kyoto, he works hard. Shinran works a, writes a lot of very erudite academic treatises these are all in Chinese. Chinese is a standard language for discipline, writing about Buddhist thought, okay? This is true, of course, not only in China, in Japan, Korea, Vietnam. Everybody learned Chinese as the lingua franca of uh, Buddhist discourse. Um, and the other thing about Shinran's writing, which is very f quite phenomenal, is that we have a lot of holographs. We have a number of writings in his own hand. Actual manuscripts of his handwriting there's nobody else from this period for which we have so much actual uh, holographs. It's quite remarkable. However, the Tani Show is not in that corpus. The Tani Show is not mentioned at all at that time. Um, so, the problem, there's problems concerning the provenance of the text. Um, it's clearly hearsay, okay, it's not written by Shinran. Um, although it's probably dated to a time between 1250 and 1260, uh, the oldest manuscript is dated 12, 1479. We don't have any printed text of it until the Edo period. That's the 17th century. And there's no author listed. <coughs> okay. Plus, we have this funny colophon in this early manuscript, the oldest manuscript, which says, do not show this to people. Don't, do not show this to the general public. Okay. So the presumption was this must have been a secret transmission. Uh, that's why it's not known about, that's why it's not written about. It's a secret transmission, probably because the doctrines are a bit radical, a bit dangerous. So, for example, maybe we'll look at the next one. The next one, chapter three, is pretty small. Okay, how about another volunteer for chapter three? Thank you, Maria. You don't have one. Oh, you do. Thanks. Well, even the 
bad are born, how much more so the good? Born here means born in the pure land, okay. At a glance, the two statements may not seem different. But in fact, the latter turns its back on the other power of the original vow. The reason is the good man who lives out of self-power fools himself, thinking to make the nimbus of his own good. He lacks the mind that turns totally to other power and does not live in Amitabha's original vow. Once the mind of self-power is flipped over, the mind cleaving to other power holds the stage, and the seeker is granted his wish to obtain birth in the truly real land of reward. Wretched, misery-filled beings that we are, whatever practice we find, nothing can free us from samsara. It is out of pure compassion that Amitabha makes the vow whose basic intention is to see even the bad bad man cleaving to other power to help him, this is the true cause of birth. Thus Paul then taught us, this true the good are said to be born, but ah, how much more so the bad. In other words, it seems to extol the virtue of being bad. Now I have to tell you that in all these 18 translations, this word bad is translated as evil. I refuse to use that word, and probably I'll be criticized forever for that purpose. But the reason why I don't like the word evil, well, if you understand evil in the sense of, you know, Leibniz, you know, in theodicy, you understand that people, you know, uh, you know, that whole study of victims of an earthquake also be considered evil. If you understand evil to include victimization, then okay. But most people don't use it that way today, okay? The other thing is, um, well, anyway, you can see that, in fact, this chapter three ends up with talking about bad people attaining Buddhahood, okay? So that's actually the original meaning of this chapter, but this chapter was flipped around, again, through hermeneutic strategies. All right, we'll get to that in a second if we have time. But anyway, tiny show in the modern world. So the legend I'm learning as a graduate student is that Kiyosawa Manchi, the founder of the Otani University, um, is the person who finally made the Tani Show a public document. Kiyosawa and his students started a journal in 1901 called Seishin Kai, Realm of the Mind, that ran until 1919. Kiyosawa was a progressive, one of the first people to incorporate European philosophy into Buddhist discourse. The legend is that he decided the Tani Show should become recognized text and told his staff to publish it serially in the journal after he died in 1903. This is how the world came to embrace it. Um, however, th three years ago, this just happened to be by accident, uh, I came across mention of a commentary of the Tani Show from the 17th century. And I thought that was really weird. And I also noticed that even before Kiyosawa started publishing it in the journal, one of the Buddhist publishers in Kyoto had published an early 19th century commentary. You know, and I thought, well, this is kind of odd. What's going on? So I asked somebody, uh, and he showed me a book about the history of the text, sort of a text critical history of the book, and, um, and all the stuff is detailed in there, and I was stunned. So I tried to get the book, but it was out of print. I called the publisher, Hozo Khan, uh, and they didn't have any. Uh, but because I'd published something for them once, they were very nice, I contacted the author, and he invited me to his house to receive a copy of the book. So I came down from Kyoto, Tokyo, all the way to Kyoto. I went to his house, he gave me the book, and then he proceeded to Give me the, the true story, okay? <laughs> and three hours, four hours of discussion, it, was, it knocked my socks off. And uh, what I discovered, uh, in fact, is that there were hermeneutic lineage of Tanisho studies in the 18th and 19th century that are very extensive, okay? In fact, this book was hotly debated, hotly um, discussed, and lots written about it, okay? I have a list of Edo period that is between 1600 and 1860, Edo period commentaries, I have 33 texts on that list, okay? But all of them, without exception, are the Higashi Honganji. None of them are the Nishi Church. Again, I don't know why. The Higashi, within the Higashi tradition, there's this huge debate culture going on, specifically about how to read this text, okay? Um, so, let's go forward. Now we get to the modern period, the Meiji period, and again, we have a lot of books written on the Tani Show. In fact, there, I have found 23 publications between 1868 and 1912. Again, 21 of the 23 are all by Higashi scholars, okay? Uh, the first book by a Nishi scholar doesn't appear until 1912, okay? Um, 
Some of these are modern uh, movable type uh, editions, of course, of Edo period writing. Some are new. But interestingly, this includes a Braille edition of the Tanya Show. It raised a question for me, when did we first have Buddhist texts in Braille? Anyone know about that? This may be the first Braille publication of any Buddhist text. I don't know. Um, 1912 again. So the fact that they're publishing in a Braille means, again, there's obviously there's a lot of interest in this thing. Okay. Um, and we have the first English translation from the Nishi side, because the Nishi church has much more extensive organization in the West. Okay. So um, speaking of whether this is the largest American Buddhism, I don't know. But um, I was talking to somebody recently who said there are 42 uh, temples of the Nishi in the United States. And they only have 39 ministers at the moment and two in training. So they're worried about that. Anyone wants a job, you know, something to think about. But, um, so that's a pretty big organization, okay? So how much of this interest is due to Kiyozawa's decision to publish it, I don't know. But um, um, clearly, the Tiny Show has really created a lot of interest in the modern period. We also have certain individuals who became famous as itinerant Tani Show preachers. Um, this is one form of the revival of the Hijiri phenomenon, I mentioned earlier, which I didn't read. But uh, Hijiri are um, Buddhist, charismatic teachers starting, f uh, we first see this word actually way back in the 8th, 9th century. And usually these are people who are uh, active outside the monastery. Some of them are trained, ordained, live in the monastery for a period of time and prefer not to be in that structured environment. Some of them are not ordained and are self-educated. Uh, they wear Buddhist robes, they shave their heads. Many of them had women and families and they lived odd lifestyles and hung out with odd people, okay? And so they were always a threat to the system, but they were always very, very uh, popular. And they're the ones that moved out and about in the countryside and really spread Buddhism around Japan. This is really being revived again, okay? In the 20th century, with these tiny show preachers. Some of them are involved in a kind of singing musical style as well. Uh, and these are kind of academic points. We don't, I guess we're running out of time. We don't have to go through this, but uh, there's a lot of, also, if you look at these 18th, 19th century commentaries, people think that they're lost chapters of the tiny show. They think it's connected to other texts. Um, and there's all very lively debate about it. So um, if you, now just focusing on the, what's happened since say the 1950s, the Tani Show now belongs to Japan as a whole. It's no longer a book of the Shin School of Buddhism. We find people write books on it who are Burakamin liberation movement. Burakamin is a kind of outcast uh, class in Japan. They're writing books on the Tani Show. We find Marxist historians writing books on the Tani Show. I have a book by a labor union leader who denounces the tiny show as, according to him, it's not the true word of Shinran, okay? Uh, we have, of course, social historians, uh, philosophers, any, uh, just all sorts of people now writing books on it. Um, and this scholar in Kyoto told me that he's collected over 300 books on the tiny show since World War II. There's three or four published every year. There's nothing like this, really. Um, probably anywhere. Anyway, um, so. What's in all this commentarial literature? Um, well, a lot of it, again, has to do with how you interpret these phrases. So for example, this chapter three that we just read that I told you people translated as evil people. Uh, and I don't like the word evil, so I don't like that. I, I recently gave a talk at a Buddhist temple in, in Berkeley, again, a Shin temple. And it was a, you know, some occasion. I don't know what it was, I forgot, but in any case, I. I said, you know, uh, I wanted to talk about this term. The whole talk was about this term, akuni, bad people, evil people. And in my view of this, Shinran gets this word from the Nirvana Sutra, the Mahapani Nirvana Sutra, this text that I'm translating, where it occurs frequently. And it never means evil people. It always means people who are troubled, okay? People who are unfortunate. That same word, aku, is used as an adjective for the animal realm, for example. Animals are not evil. Animals are in a limited, they're unfortunate because they're limited in what they can do. That's really how that sutra uses the word, and I'm sure that's how Shinran is meaning it as well. We also know that Akko is a very 
I, I've looked at Japanese literature for the time. Aku is a term that samurai like to use to boast of how badass they are. You know? So they add it to their name willy-nilly, even though it's not there. Okay? If it means evil, it means tough guy evil. You know? So um, the other thing is we look at these early commentaries. So the, the, this phrase, Aku ni shoki, is the way um, everybody talks about that chapter 3 that we just read, that the Buddha's, the Buddha's Dharma is really intended for people who are evil. Uh, but in fact, if you look at chapter 3, you look at these early commentaries in Japan, they're saying it's not about that, it's about bad people, in fact, can become Buddhas as well. Okay? It's about Buddhahood. So if you read it this way, then you see this is connected to the notion of <coughs> Buddha nature and Tathagatagarbha. And one of those books over there, by the way, so I just brought four of my collection. I have about 10 or 12 books now on the Chinese show. It's just endless. I never know when to buy, when not to buy. But anyway, um, so here's one right here that says, bad people become Buddhas, OK? So that's, again, a Higashi perspective. You won't see that from the Nishi side. So one of the big differences, and again, this, what's interesting in the kind of way this stuff is discussed is the, the he kills out a line on the Higashi side, the Otani side, which is, only has three temples in America, so it's very smallly represented, um, but they're larger in Brazil. Their perspective is, um, the Buddha may be the source of liberation and the source of truth, but you have to discipline yourself to reach out <coughs> to touch that. It's not completely passive. The, the, uh, the, Nishi, translate, the Nishi perspective and is one in which all form of practice that you engage in, if you think it's going to yield something, is considered self-power and therefore <coughs> a bad thing. Okay? The Higashi side is you have to know what, what practice means in order to understand what other power is, the other power being the power of the Buddha. So it's much more demanding and much more in, in line with traditional Buddhism. <coughs> also, interestingly, and I don't know why, again, it's another kind of mystery to me, but Shinran, of all of Shinran's writings, the two sutras he quotes the most often, the one is the Major Pure Land Sutra in which the myth of Amitabha is explaining the vows are delineated. But the second most quoted sutra is not a Pure Land Sutra at all, it's the Nirvana Sutra, it's the Mahapada Nirvana Sutra, which is known primarily for being a sutra about Buddha nature. Okay? Shirman talks about Buddha nature repeatedly in his writings. And again, on the Higashi side, the Otani side, this is discussed a lot. Okay? And so this doctrine of even bad people can become Buddhas is all about Buddha nature. It's all about the fact that you have the nature of the Buddha inside yourself. And so it doesn't matter what you're doing, because the potential is never, is never removed. But the other side, the Nishi side people, they don't talk about that. They don't have a chair in Nirvana Sutra studies at their university the way the Otani people do. So, such is, such, now this is my project. So, this is the last thing I want to share with you. This is something I came up with. So last year I ended up being in Kyoto four times. And I'm sure I saw Jamie each time. There's no avoiding him, you know. And I used my time there to pitch the idea of a joint workshop to critically read these dominant pre-modern, that is influential pre-modern and modern books on the Tani Show, and essays about it, to investigate what the hubbub is all about, to try to determine why this book has such an appeal, okay, and how it has been understood and argued and debated in, t in time. Um, and I asked, I call for two meetings each year, one in Berkeley and one in Kyoto. There's two Shin universities in Kyoto, Ryukoku and Otani, the, the Higashi and Nishi schools. Uh, and so I went to both of them. And I said, let's do this together, all three of us. And they agreed. So we're right now we're in the midst of signing our memorandums of understanding. And we're going to start our first workshop in Berkeley on March 24th. And then there'll be one in early August at Otani, then in Berkeley again in March. Next year we'll have one at Ryukoku, the other school. Um, and I asked for travel money for grad students to attend, not from these schools, because these schools all have money, but from other schools. Okay? I want any student from any school to be able to attend who has the language ability and the interest, okay? anywhere in the world. In fact, the first person who applied was from China, believe it or not. Um, and the workshop will be conducted in English, even though the primary reading materials are all being in Japanese. Okay? And this uh, sort of pushes American students, Western students, to work, to believe that they can learn how to read commentarial ja literature and <laughs> Buddhist commentarial literature in Japanese, and also push the Japanese students to be able to express themselves in English, 
write papers, publish papers in English. So I envision this leading to essentially uh, two books. One is an annotated translation in which the Tanah Show is retranslated, but now based on all this commentarial material that, f that tells us how it was actually read in the past. Okay. Um, and the other um, is to produce a series of critical essays summarizing the various ways the Tanah Show has been used and described and argued uh, in modern Japan, which again is very, very lively. So, um, and finally, you know, how do we get here? Is this interest in the tiny show purely a modern phenomenon? I don't think so, but nonetheless, it's, it's, it shows that in Japan, this book has staying power, okay? And maybe there's something that can appeal to other people as well. So that's what I'm doing. In a sense, this is the Tayuno legacy, sort of on steroids, I don't know. And, uh, <laughs> um, and that's where I am. Okay, thanks very much. <laughs> You're good for questions, right, Mark? Yeah, happy to take questions from anybody. Yeah. I had a question, uh, the importance of, uh, thank you for your talk, it's so informative. I could sit here for three hours and listen to this. Thank you very much. Is the importance of women in the spreading Shinra's teaching, wasn't his daughter instrumental in preserving a lot of that when, when, after Shinra died? And also, the second question is, uh, Amida Butsu is a, is a cosmic Buddha, and Sakamuni is the Could you describe that they worship the cosmic Buddha, not necessarily historic Sakamuni? And then the uh, third one is, is, uh, is uh, the third question would be, uh, how did, when Shinra died, I read someplace, he, he didn't want to be buried, he wanted to be thrown in the water. To be eaten. Right, that's in the Tani Show also. He says, yeah, by the way, don't bury me, just throw my body in the river, you know. Now he says that because at that time, there's a lot of warfare happening, and they can't deal with all the bodies. So people go out to the river and they see bodies floating down the river all the time, apparently. So he said, you know, just treat me that way. Shinran continually denies that he's a saint or even a special person. So he says, don't treat me in any special way, you know. Like he says, I present this to you, take it or leave it, and go off on your way, and I'm a nobody, you know. Um, so the role of his daughter and his wife in this tradition is very important. However, um, this is rather, I'll try to make it as simple and brief as possible. Yeah. Um, so what happened was when Shinran comes back to Kyoto, okay, so he's there for another 30 years. He lives to be quite old and uh, he's supported essentially by his community of followers outside the city. Uh, Shinran, by the way, has never mentioned any historical record of the time. He has no historical profile whatsoever, unlike Honan, who was mentioned everywhere. Okay. Um, so when Shinran dies, there's a, there's a bit of a dispute about what to do with him. Okay. Obviously, they don't throw him in the river. Okay. Uh, so for a while, they have a kind of a shrine around his grave. And the person who's in charge of that shrine becomes essentially the leader of the church. Okay. Um, and through his daughter, preserving, deciding that she needs to preserve this stuff. And by the way, the person we think is the author of the Tani Show, uh, his father married Shinran's daughter, okay? So they're somehow connected, all right? Anyway. He had like seven kids. Uh, yeah, he has seven. Anyway, it's a complex relationship. But in fact, if you look at who's coming to see Shinran at that time, and you look at who's actually active, his own children are not, do not represent him. The people that he really has the most contact with are his Dharma successors, not his family successors. And in fact, one of the uh, 18th century commentaries I saw believes that uh, this tiny show is connected to another lineage text in which Shinran designates who his Dharma successor is, and it's another monk, okay? It's not uh, his family. So uh, for the first 200 years after Shinran's death, there's like a bunch of different branches of his line, and the Honganji, and what makes the Honganji different is that it's a bloodline as well as a dharma line, okay? Uh, they are not the biggest. They're like number three. It's father to son. Yeah, father to son, right. And, but they work very hard to legitimate themselves. So they, what, <laughs> so you can see what's happening is they draw on this kind of Confucian uh, ancient notion that I'm in the line of the family and therefore I have some legitimacy. At the same time, I have this dharma transmission. They say we're the only people that have both those things, right? But that doesn't really work until the 15th century when um, this guy Renyo comes along 
and he knows how to exploit that well. And again, the country breaks out in civil war, and he's able to sort of organize people in a way that protects them, and suddenly a lot of temples join his movement because they feel they need protection, so, and whatever other reason. So that's how Hongaji becomes so big. But women do have an important role, and Renyo, by the way, has very interesting writings about women. Uh, he has very explicit anti, you know, uh, critiques about uh, prejudice toward women. So one of the things about this Pure Land line, and by the way, you know, if, if for fans of Dogen, for example, here we are at Smith College. So for fans of Dogen, Dogen's view on women is very problematic. I don't know if you know this, but, well, Dogen doesn't say that, but he is very suspicious of them. Yeah, in the beginning, Dogen is very open also. He's very, he's very critical of people who have sexual prejudices, but as he gets older, Wow, he really doesn't want women in the monastery, he doesn't want them around, they're a threat to his community, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I don't know if he considers them evil, but um, it's, it's a problem, you know. So, and the other problem is, of course, the presumption at that time was if you're born as a woman, it's a kind of a karmic punishment, right? Because you obviously have second, second tier status in society. Uh, but you can see from this point of view, that's not a hindrance, you know. If anything, that makes you more open to the Buddha's message, right? Because anyone who has a, some recognition of the inability of themselves to become a Buddha in this life, which at that time was everybody, you know, so that's one of the appeals of the Tani show, is let's be real here, who's becoming a Buddha, right? We don't see it, and therefore let's accept who we really are. Yeah, this, one follow-up question, Bill, yeah. is, is not an understanding. When he was 20 years in the countryside, he had to uh, express his beliefs in Buddhism that was, that was understandable to common people that couldn't read or Right. And Buddhism, I mean, you, you know this more than me, obviously, but Buddhism was only re reserved for the aristocracy. They could actually go into temples where the common people were excluded, so... Yeah, there's been a lot of writing about that. That's actually not true. That's, oh, okay. Okay. yeah, that's an old, old because myth. Because they had to make... Uh, really, yeah, before that time, that's true. But see, this Hijiri thing that I talked about before, the Hijiri are mostly functional in the countryside. There's a lot of Buddhism going on. But it's, uh, and there are branch temples in the countryside as well. But it's the same, the problem is, and this is perhaps is one reason why monasticism fails in Japan, is the monasteries are threatened by too much time of non-monastics coming into the monastery. Because then the monks are tempted, right, to go out into the world. And obviously their resolve to lead a monastic life is not strong enough. So it's not just women, but it's just that whole other secular culture, okay? And so in some sense, there, that's why there was a kind of, in the beginning, right, a real wall. Plus, a lot of the early monasteries are paid for by the government. The monks are civil servants in a way, and they're told what the rules are, which is to keep the other people out. You're doing this for the state. You're not doing it for the population. But by the time you get to Shinran, there's a lot of Buddhism all over the place, yeah. You know, and so uh, I don't think Shinran had any problem communicating. But it raises another question is, both people like Shinran and Honen and Dogen write a lot in Japanese. It's not till this period, the 1230s, well, Honen's actually the first person in the 1190s, actually writing in Japanese. Until that time, all Buddhist treatises have to be written in Chinese. The fact they're writing in Japanese means they're not afraid to use their own language, the actual language of speech, right? Because nobody spoke Chinese in Japan. Uh, and so that's also a big shift, okay? So Tiny Show being a Japanese language document, and by the way, very beautifully written Japanese. Some people think Shinran didn't write it because it's so beautiful. I don't know, you know. <laughs> it's got a literary quality to it, you know, it's very nice. So um, it's also part of the shift that's happening. In a way, you, you could see the politics of this of Buddhist texts in Chinese versus Buddhist texts in Japanese. And this is obviously the kind of popular form, right? Well, thank you. Sure. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering what, where does this uh, land in your, you know, Theravada, Mahayana, Vajrayana, um, History, um, line, spectrum. spectrum. It seems like it's, you know, the Sendai, as far as I know, is a Vajrayana uh, tradition. No, it's a Mahayana tradition that has a Vajrayana component. But in China, it does not have a Vajrayana component. That was added in Japan uh, because Vajrayana became very popular. Um, and so Tendai develops a very strong Vajrayana component. But Tendai was never really dominated by Vajrayana. That was just one. There's really four f kinds of religion within Tendai, okay, in Japan. One is traditional Chinese Tendai, uh, which is very Manyamaka centered um, and very Tathagatagarbha, sort of a, a mixture of Buddha nature theory and emptiness theory of Nagarjuna. Another is a Vajrayana form, another is the Pure Land form, and another is a Zen form, okay. So by the time you get to the 12th century when Tendai's hegemony falls apart, all four forms kind of go off on their own, okay. 
So the Nichiren, who's a, a, a Lotus Sutra person, he takes the traditional Chinese Tendai approach with the Lotus Sutra and the Nirvana Sutra, the main ten tenets. The Vajrayana people, obviously, well, in Japan, Vajrayana kind of, you know, doesn't do too well after that, but it keeps going. It never disappears, uh, particularly in terms of magical activity, like getting it to rain, you know, and when you, for illness and things like that. Vajrayana has a very strong appeal to people uh, on that side. Um, but the monastic Vajrayana in Japan really shrinks after that. And there were two forms that really take off for Zen and Pure Land. Okay. But all, you know, Honen, Shinran, Dogen, they're all, they're all ordained in Tendai. They're all Tendai monks. Well, that's a tough question. Uh, yes and no. <laughs> uh, I mean, in general, you know, traditional religion, of course, is not doing well everywhere. Um, and um, on the other hand, um, I see a lot of activity. But of course, people are, young people are looking for something that relates to, that they can relate to as part of their own experience. So part of the problem in Japan is until, say, 1960, the public education included a lot of Buddhist history in it, and Buddhist culture and Buddhist thought. After 1960 or so, it gets pushed out, okay, and the emphasis is much more on something close to our own educational system. So people grow up without hardly any knowledge of Buddhism. So if they don't have a connection with a temple or with a particular group, they don't know about it. But I've met a, a number of young people who, when they stumble across it, are very excited by it. And partly it's because there are a lot of kind of charismatic teachers around. And there's a lot of activity, and there's a lot of there's music, there's festivals, you know, things like this. So like that picture I show from that festival, you go to see that festival, you'll be knocked out. Even if you don't know what it is or what they're doing, it's beautiful, you know, it's really moving. So, um, I, you know, on the other hand, I mean, for example, you compare Japan with Korea, the reason I mentioned the missionary thing is 40% of Korea is now Christian. Uh, and they spent more money in Japan, I think, with only 1% of the population has turned. So, if the young people are less interested in traditional Buddhism, they're not turning to something else. Although they turn to Tibetan Buddhism, they turn to anything, you know, that's of interest to them. But it usually just has to be something new. Yeah. Um, I was always been fascinated by the Kamakam and the manuscript. And I had understood that that was by Renyo. Yes. People who are not karmically prepared for it. I have not seen anyone talk about that. I'm sure it must come up, though. Um, and <coughs> it's, it appears, again, that because Again, this is a, a place where the Higashi and the Niji schools really part company. And, I, and again, I don't know when this really starts, but um, the commentaries that I've looked at, and there are a lot, there's, you know, there's thir 30 of them. So I haven't, I, haven't had, I haven't got my hands on them. You know, they're not published, things like this. They're in manuscript form. But they're concerned with the, it's, most of it's exegetical word by word. It's like Buddha Gosa. What does this word mean? That's really what they're doing in great detail. And... <laughs> And often there'll be other stories that are brought in, other scriptures that'll be brought in, trying to explain what they think is going on. <laughs> I haven't seen that, but it's a really good question. Yeah, hopefully we will see that, and we'll see how people thought about that. You know, it's, you're right, it is a kind of contradiction. But you have to remember also, Renyo's time was one of great political instability, right? <coughs> and I should also mention that the Pure Land School in Japan is constantly persecuted, continually, over and over again, and this goes on. <coughs> From Shinran's lifetime all the way back through Renyo as well. And so I think that's what Renyo was afraid of. The people will see this thing that says, oh, the bad people, the evil people are really favored by the Buddha. And they'll say, because there was, that was part of the complaint in Honen, against Honen also, was that this encouraged people to do whatever the hell they wanted. The worse they were, the more the Buddha will notice them. And so therefore, you know, we can't allow that kind of thing. That's like socially unacceptable. I think that's what Renyo, I think that's what Renyo was talking about. That's what my Japanese friends say he was talking about, but what the commentary say, I don't know. It's a good question, yeah. Well, she has a question, yeah. It relates in a way to this. Um, I infer from everything that you've said that the content 
of this kind of thing would be very different from the published work of Schindler. But could you just say a little bit about that? Oh, well, actually, I mean, they're, they're, um, the Tanish, for the people who recognize this as a legitimate transmission, they don't say that at all. They say Shinran has imp implied the same thing in other places, and they point to various contexts. But again, it depends on how you read this stuff. There's also um, a work by Kakunyo, who's like great-grandson, great-great-grandson of Shinran, who writes a number of treatises that kind of help establish the sect. And he alludes to things that are right out of the Tanisho. Some people think he's actually looking at the Tanisho when he's writing this. Um, but I think, um, in fact, as far as I read this also, I don't think this is quite that much different. I think it's just more of a more direct communicative approach because he's actually writing us, or his, he's been quoted from us, he's actually speaking, whereas his Chinese writings are very formal. Um, but, you know, part of that, for example, he doesn't mention Buddha nature in here. He mentions Buddha nature in a lot of his other writings all the time. So you have to decide how to interpret that. This thing we just read about being a bad person, what does that mean? You know, that's a big area of discussion. And how do you, in other words, there's, it's one thing to say, I have done bad things. It's another to say, I have a kind of self-awareness of being a bad person. It's another to say, no, what this is really about is that it's just simply a metaphor for the fact that I'm not going to become a Buddha in this lifetime. It's an existential acceptance of that fact. And then therefore my orientation to religion must be different because this is a religion about becoming a Buddha, I'm not going to become a Buddha. Therefore, what should I do? Okay, that's really uh, what the Eastern Church approach is. And then that opens up all sorts of other things, right? That's not in there. This is just a kind of summary. You're getting the conclusion, you know, of some of the long discussion, right? So I think it's so far, you know, but, but I should say that there are a number of books, people that denounce, like this book. You know, this guy doesn't believe that it could represent Shinra. You know, there are people who say that. Yeah. Speak up, speak up. Right. Yeah, but they're never considered Buddhists. Never. They're never considered Buddhists. In other words, that no one gets that designation because nobody has sarvanya. No one has omniscience. Okay. So there are people who've turned it around. In fact, there are a lot of people. That's what makes the Treeline tradition so interesting, is because that's the only place where you see people are explicit about this, that they've done things like Milarepa did, and they've turned themselves around. So I guess They're criminals, you know. Yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. So the reincarnation part? Part of it's reincarnation, part of it is they're, they're obviously enlightened in this, in this lifetime, you know, but they're not Buddhas. I know, but it's like semantics. <laughs> well, it depends on what, you, no, I don't think so. <laughs> Depends on what, you know, you, you know the, the Japanese perspective is um, history matters, okay? And the sutras repeatedly predict the decline of Buddhism. We are long since past the age when the true Dharma is available historically. And so that's part of the existential honesty of the Japanese Buddhism. And so what does that mean? You know, people don't become Buddhas in this age anymore. The sutras all tell us this. So we have to find other, other mechanisms and what can we really honestly expect, okay? And so part of being enlightened is, is a journey to self-acceptance of what your limitations are. And part of that awakening is that you're not a Buddha, right? This is what makes yeah. it so fascinating as to what uh, he was so upset about, that, you know, what troubled him so much that, and what was it that, I mean, I find that so fascinating. Yeah. Because it's just like everyone has their own individual karmic aspirations. Right. Well, if we had it, you know, the trouble is we have like four Bhagavad of Shinra and they're all different. So, <laughs> and again, because he's not a historically known person, no, but the only, all these are written by people within his own school. Uh, like in the case of Honan, his teacher, he was such a famous person that a lot of people wrote about him. You see him mentioned in lots of different sources, so you could sort of try to triangulate and put that stuff together and evaluate the you know, relative real veracity of the different materials. But in the case of Shinran, we have very little material. It's all in-house. It's all hagiographic. Well, I mean, it's yeah. not any different, really, than talking to the Buddha. 
Yeah, yeah. Some, yeah. You know, but Same still, thing. somehow, the, the story gets passed down and people do get inspired and motivated. And that's what this is. That's exactly what this is. And that's why people turn to this over and over again, you know. So there's something about, there's some, I believe, sort of in conclusion, there's some, <laughs> I believe, my guess, okay, is that what really makes this text so appealing is Shinran's deep, enormous sincerity about accepting his situation. This existential honesty, you know, about this is what it is, okay. This is what it is for someone who's not going to be a Buddha, okay. Maybe you may think of me that way, but I'm telling you, I'm not a Buddha, okay. No matter what you say about me, he refuses to accept any kind of saintly status. Refuses to his dying day. And people are going nuts about him, you know. So that's what's really different about this, and I think that really appeals to the Japanese, right. And some kind of internal dialogue about the relation between who I think I am and who I want to be and what I really am and that kind of thing, you know. Yeah. Right. Exactly this concept. That's why the Japanese probably love this text so much because it, it, it incorporates that sense of Absolutely. I'm going to fail, but I'm going to try my best. And what's interesting, that she's talking about a, a very famous book written about, uh, by a Japanese literary scholar. Yeah, that nobility of failure, what's noble about it, again, is the existential honesty exactly. about it, right? Exactly. And these people who are considered failures are, in fact, from our perspective, not failures at all. They're tremendous individuals who achieve tremendous things, right? But in their own eyes, they're failures. And maybe their careers didn't work out. You know, maybe they didn't get a job at Berkeley. They ended up in the middle of nowhere, you know? <laughs> that, is, that is the appeal. And you know, Shinran died in poverty, I suspect. And I think people really respect that too. That he's not a famous person in his lifetime. You know, that's part of the, part of the appeal. Even, even in the baseball games in Japan, yeah. Oh, there you go. <laughs> uh, Thanks. And thank you, Mark, for bringing Tayo back to life with this great talk. Thank All right, I appreciate it. <laughs> okay, we have some food and drink uh, across the way, so if you want to continue talking.